Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video I will be showing you a new way of doing procedural shading and I will be using uh, several different AI nodes combining them together to get a nice uh, base color and I will be using that to kind of replicate this Deadpool um, 3D print. On the left you can see it's uh, the final result. It's definitely more stylized than the result or than the reference. Uh, but you can see the reference images are pretty nice. Uh, you can see still the layering of the 3D print, which I did not incorporate in the render, but it, it's easy to do. Uh, but I try to get the nice um, curvature stuff and the holes and you can see that we kind of have the, the logo is like in be, um, being brighter on the, on the edges. And I kind of try to incorporate that. Um, and obviously I try to make a more interesting lighting setup, which I think uh, looks pretty pretty cool and I will be showing you the whole scene from scratch and I will be providing the model, the lights, the HDRs, the whole Maya file and the um, reference images. So if you want to get access to this stuff, please uh, follow me on Patreon, uh, become a member and you have access to the source files and also um, feel free to follow me also on, on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. And yeah, so on Instagram, my tag is just uh, my full name, Instagram.com, Arvid Schneider. And here you have always um, obviously some personal images, but also if I post new stuff, it will also go on here. So you can see there is like the robot, there's a Jurassic Park poster and all the stuff I, I did recently, images, whatever. So you can see what's going on. And obviously there is the Slack channel, which you go on lightshader.slack.com. You can get the invite on um, lightshader.de and at the bottom is the um, sign in button so when that page loads scroll all the way to the bottom and you get the slack group and this will give you um, access to this group there are a few like 500 members uh, it's pretty active lots of people asking questions i'm trying to help most of the time but all the other people are helping as well, which is nice. It's it's a little growing community, which is cool. And then obviously Patreon, where you get access to the source files. You can have uh, exclu uh, You can have support from me if you want to have a quick uh, hangout session with me, and I can give you help on certain things you need. All that stuff is happening. So Instagram, Slack, and Patreon. That's the main things you can get in touch. Obviously Twitter as well. But this is uh, a a. Typical thing where I also post my stuff, so you can follow me there as well. Anyway, so let's jump in. This is my scene I have prepared. Um, this is my um, pre tutorial test scenes. Um, this is kind of how it will look, and we will be creating this whole thing from scratch. So I will be just hitting um, Ctrl N for a new scene, completely empty, and I will hit File, Save As. So we're on the right spot and we just call this m2a.518.training.ma. Alrighty, so this is saved. And the first thing I like to do is create a few top level groups. So the one is LGT. Um, then we have uh, Geo. And what else do we need? Camera, I guess, which is the main cam. If you have more, obviously, it makes sense to group them. If you have just one, it doesn't really make sense, but I just I just like to keep it clean. So this is my way of doing things. Geo is most of the time the sign in my case. Uh, camera is, I think I had it on black most of the time. Okay, so then I create a new camera. So let's just do view create from view this is my main render cam and this drops into camera and then i like to have a focal length of 80 millimeters and okay so this is my basic setup and what i do now is i'll just drop in the geometry which you can find in the resource folder which when you want to follow along it's in the resource folder and you just drop in the deadpool bust object um, and you should get it right here. So, and then obviously we need to rotate it by 90 on X. I was hitting uh, J to snap, so that's helpful, I guess. 
So that's the geo. It's pretty high detail. It's it's not perfect, but it it's it's very nice to just do quick lighting tests, and it's obviously triangulated because it's a three D print model. Um, but it's still it's still very cool. So for the render, I need to subdivide it once. So I go directly. Let's first rename this and remove the namespaces. So window general namespace editor select that guy and hit delete merge with root so that's gone and just call this maybe deadpool uh bust or whatever you want to know uh do and put it into geo geo group so it's nice and structured and then on the on the shape node of the deadpool bust on the arnold tab subdivision enable cat clark and maybe two iterations um, most of the time one is enough if it's just highly decimated already so it in control and s saving this guy and so the next step what I like to do is uh, import or set up my my global lighting my environment light so in that case I would do lights sky dome light which is my ENV light drop it into light group call this maybe uh lgt env it's uh it's up to you it's it's your light it's your scene this is just a convention i used to learn and uh, let's just drop in the studio hdr file in the scene and at the bottom if you enable the um, disable DAC objects you should get a file node i hope okay it doesn't work if you drop it in the scene so in the hyper shade uh let's just drop it there did I close it now? I guess I did. Okay, so I'm just opening up the location again. And we here, resources, and I just drop it into the hypershade. There we go. So now we have a file node created and we will just connect this with my uh, color slot in the uh, dome light. That's connected resolution, depends on the input size. So uh, let's just do 248 which is the width of the image. So I'm not sure if it's exactly that, but that's something you can check. And I like to always do like three samples. Depending on your AA samples, um, you should not go higher than three because it gets multiplied. So let's just not, just, let's just stick with two for now. Uh, now we should have this one in here. So that's the HDR, which is also provided in the scene files. And I would like to have the backdrop behind the character. So I'll be just rotating it by, I guess, 90 it is. So yeah, so now he's kind of behind it and he, he gets the bounce light from the bottom and these two lights there. Um, I'm not sure how good the HDR is, but I will be adding other lights anyways to that. So uh, viewport sky radius, I just make this bigger. Um, so it's not interfering with my setup. And then I need to change the clipping planes of the camera to see the background again. So I just added another zero. So we see that thing back. Okay. Right, so this would be the first step. And if I hit render now, uh, let's see, Arnold render. Okay, so it's loading up at the bottom. And this is what we get on the default scene setup. Um, it's running through perspective camera, like so. Let me let me just quickly update progressive on, so it should update pretty quick. Check render settings. It's on three. I'll have a default preset. Do it on default, so it's five one one. We have ray depth of two on default, and let's just bring AA samples down to two. So now it's nice and snappy, right? That's what we like. Okay, so before we go into lighting, what I like to do is assign a shader, which is a favorite AI standard surface shader. And my default settings is fully white, uh, fully the weight on one and the color is a uh, 0 0.18, which is a default gray. Um, at first it looks very dark, but it's, it's pretty uh, neutral. If you would put this gray sphere ball into sunlight, it would be pretty bright. So this is just a good um, reference point to set up your lights. And then roughness for this guy is obviously it's too shiny for now. So let's just do a roughness of 0.6. So we get a almost like a Lambert shader again. And yeah, so this would be the basic lighting. So now what I want to do is uh, look through my main cam. 
and show my resolution gate and just do a nice framing here. So I'm not sure. We can also change the resolution if we need to. So instead of uh, 1920 by 1080, we can do, um, I guess, let's just do 1500 in, in height and width would be maybe 1000. Uh, let's just see what we get now if I change my display and I do my overscan. So that's what we got right now. So I think we are still on a yeah we are on 80 so this actually fits pretty good thousand by 1500 and now I'll just lock this guy so I'm uh, clicking the button so I cannot translate the camera window anymore and now I'm switching back to perspective and now we should be good if I update the scene we should get an update here as well and this is now my new render window so uh, because it is now like taller than it is wide, I like to actually move it, move the window to the side instead. So now I'm docking it on the side window, locking it again. So now I can actually just move it here. And on the middle piece, I can actually work with the hyper shade as well. So I'm not sure I can't move this anymore. This seems to be locked now, weirdly enough. But anyways, let's just move this guy over. <clears throat> and now this is what we got. And before, okay, before we will really play around with the shaders, let's just name this to Deadpool. And this would be also AI, just to call it main, like this. Okay, so if I save the scene, hit play, and now we should be still able to do this. Yeah, okay, that's all good. So I think the next step would be to place some lights in neutral shader environment. So to do that, I go to view panes and this is also weird. So I think I need to change the near clip plane to one maybe or the bigger one to that. There we go, okay. So creating lights. So I go to Arnold tab lights area lights. So this is area light one. I drop it in my light group. Call this. Uh, let's let's make a nice uh, rim light from from the from the right. So let's just call it LGT underscore rim. And now I have light shader. It's a light control window. Uh, okay, which does not work right now. Doesn't matter. It's just a little bug, but you can still view it. So look through selected and we have the rim like so and now if I hit play that's actually still running so now all I got to do is change my exposure maybe to 15 and okay so it's definitely lighting the scene and it's definitely way too bright because I actually changed the ENV instead of the uh, rim light so let's try 15 again What's going on here? Okay, let's try update scene. Okay, there we go. It was just an update issue. So now you can see on the left, the, the light is updating. Uh, it's working pretty cool. Okay, so now first we head over to perspective and you can see it's a really tiny light, which is not realistic at all. So to get the proper sh uh, shadow softness, make it like a real scale light would be like a soft box. This is a small soft box. So let's go a bit bigger like this maybe. And obviously this is way too close to the character because if he would move it, he would immediately walk out of the light. So let's just uh, pan it a bit differently. Go um, further back, more, uh, we wanted to have a rim actually. So, oh, let's just enable also save UI threads three. So we have should have a faster feedback in the UI. And now because it's further away, we need to increase the um, energy of the light. So let's go to 20 maybe. And now you can see we get this nice hot rim. And depending where you position it, you get a different effect of the light itself. But I think it's nice. It's highlighting the eyes, the, the eye, what's it called? The, the bone there, I don't know, the nose. And it's a nice side lit rim light, which is pretty cool. Um, obviously you can play around with color. I like always to have the contrast of the light and 
um, uh, cool and warm. So you can use temperature if you want to and play around with the um, upper end, which makes gives you a blue rim something like this and obviously you can just duplicate the light and let's call this one uh, key <clears throat> and the key let's make the key warmer uh, let's say 5000 Kelvin for the warm light maybe four or five and say key panels look through selected so now we're looking through the key light and let's just move this guy over to get a nice key direction of this guy, which is also fairly rimlet, but it's still more, it gives, it's the main light direction. So that's why it's called key. And in perspective, so now you can see this is my setup. So I've got my rim here and the key there. So if you wanna have hard shadows from the key light, instead of these nice and soft ones, you need to scale the light source. And depending if you have normalized on or off, it's a different type of light. So I think if normalizes on, the light intensity does not change based on the scale. So you can see it keeps the same intensity, um, but it changes the shadow softer. So, and if this is off and I just dial in my temperature or my exposure to some value and I would scale the light now, you should see it's actually changing the light intensity also so that's something it's more artistic or easy to work with if normalizers on and you set a fixed exposure of uh, 20 maybe or a bit more for the key light and then you can just scale the lights to adjust the sh uh, shadow softness so now now i'm just rendering this portion here and you can see if i make it really small you get these really hard shadows which gives a really nice key light direction. And you can see if I make it bigger, they get really soft and you get a more like a diffuse light on here. So hard shadows, really soft shadows. And I wanna go for really hard shadows on this case. So, and now we can, you can see it's pretty hard, which it's cool. It's a nice fall off still, but you get the idea of really hard shadows right there. So let's do a look through selected one more time and maybe just angle it from a bit more higher point. So you get these nice cheekbone shadows as well, just for more artistic looking images. Something like this. So this would be now, I guess, the, the broad light setup. We can dial in more. Let's just try 21 for exposure. And I think uh, this looks pretty cool already. And if you want, you can dial down the environment light a bit under uh, exposure, negative exposure to just reduce the fill. And now you get a nice contrast image, but I think that this went too far. So let's just go on zero and keep it on default. So this would be now the light setup for this guy. And you can see now, even though we initially we had a pretty dark shader now it looks pretty good right in the, in the in the nice light and it's a very natural fall off so let's save this guy and just save this image as well and i think this was my test so I'll delete this guy okay so this is our starting point for lighting uh, for shading and for shading let's just change the resolution to 50 percent to get even faster feedback on the shader changes so now i'm changing my ui to hypershade Selecting that pool and right click to get just a shader layout. Alrighty, so the first thing what I want to do, I want to have it a metal object. So you can see the reference images. It looks pretty metallic. So what I want to do at first is change the mode to be a metallic shader. Right, so we first change the shader to metalness to one, and now we have a metal shader, right? So it's fully metal. It has a, a base color of this dark gray. Uh, you can see it's already it changed in the render to don't have any diffuse component anymore. So that's what we want. So um, before we really go to the final render, what I want to do to to illustrate what we did here is we need several things. We need occlusion because you can see that in the ridges it's really dark and you will have curvature. So on the edges, you can see that there is a brighter color. So all these things we need to consider and we will be doing this right now. 
So I'm just uh, minimizing. Okay, so the first thing what I always like to do is create a AI occlusion. Uh, AI ambient occlusion shader, which is this guy. And I already know I want to use curvature, so I'll create an AI curvature node. And I also know I want to use a facing ratio node. So these three nodes I will be using and then I will be stacking them in several layers to make it very interesting. So this approach will be a bit different. I will be using this all of these guys on the left as mask inputs for a color correct node. And so I will create the AI color correct, which is my um, my input color and this will go into my base color of my main shader. So currently the input is black, but I want to have already at f in the beginning, I want to set up some some slight variations and you can see that there is like, it's it's not fully uniform. There is color differentiation and somehow the, sh the hotkey for n minimize doesn't work here. But anyway, so I want to create a um, simple noise, AI noise like this, which goes into the input of my AI color correct. And I want to enable isolate selected so I can only see what my selected node looks like. And you can see the noise is way too small. So I'm changing the scale maybe to uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 0 0.05. So now I get a pretty um, large scale pattern. I want to add a little bit of distortion just to get more interesting results. And yeah, so this should be all I want to do. And then I will just, because it's a metal shader, um, the colors here are representing how reflective it is. So a fully white one is almost like a chrome shader and uh, the darker we get, it's more like uh, dielectric. So we want to have an interesting range, maybe something like this as my base color. So the, the brightest color is 0.3, which is fine. And the darkest is point. Let's just go to 0.1 for the darkest color. And this will be my input for my metal. So now, even though it, it looks similar, there is definitely a color variation now appearing. So you can see now what's going on there. So let's just call this um, AI noise. And this would be my base. And this would be my, uh, let's just say AI CC base as well. And from here on, we do color corrections on this input color. So if I isolate this, this is my base color. And then we will be using these three guys on the left to create interesting um, breakups on the base color. So first of all, let's connect the um, amino occlusion to an AI range node, which is just um, a min max, so you can control the values a bit better. And the out red is just a float color. You can use green or blue because it's all grayscale. And this connects into the mask of the base color. So if I want to visualize the occlusion, I can just click on it and this is now what happens. So this is what the occlusion looks like. And if I, oops, and if I scale this window now down by a bit, which I can't do, why not? Window, let's see, mode, resize, no, I just want to scale it actually. Let's see if there's a way to do this. Uh, minimize locked window. I don't think there is a way to, because I made it full screen, I can't really, Anyways, let's just minimize it. I wanted to have it as an overlay. Maybe I should close it, save it, desktop, and try it again. Sorry for this. Saving scene. Let's try to reopen this guy. No, I don't think it worked. It's still full screen. Hmm. Anyways, never mind. So occlusion. So um, you can change the distance here. So we want to have it just uh, maybe five units from the shading point to find occluding objects or 10 units. And then you can play around with the spread to get more contrast in this guy. But we want to have it pretty large because it should go in all the ridges. So something like this. And then I want to arrange it so um, I can actually control it a bit better. So if I want to make it dark, I just um, change the input min. So now I can see we get a lot more contrast in this. And obviously, 
this might be a bit too much, but this is just a mask and this will drive in the end the, the color corrector node. So let's just see what this hap this does. So the occlusion goes into my base like this. And now if I would just, because I want to make it darker, I can just multiply it based on the, the mask input. So if I reduce uh, the multiply color, you can see what's going on here. So it's, it's definitely doing the opposite. So I want to switch these guys out. So white is black and black is white. So I get the inverse. And then let's see what this does. And now you can see I can just um, color correct or darken the areas I need. And this is just a color corrector. So it's very handy. And you can lock this, lock the render node to the color corrector if you hit the little lock icon in the bottom. And then you can still play around with the ranges and see what results you get. Um, so this is interesting. So this would be now my m metal reflective color. So you can see it's really dark in the ridges where there is some dirt occlusion or something like that. I, th I still think my base is a bit too dark, but we just keep it for now like it is. And uh, now we just jump to the curvature. So I'll create a range again. It's just, it's just a habit for me to be able to control it more uh, precise. Um, you don't need to do it. You can just use it directly, but it's, it's for me more control. So I'm duplicating control D the CC with a color correct node and the out color of the base one goes into the input of the curvature one um, like this. And then the out color of this goes into the base. So now we should have um, still the same result, but because we don't have a mask input. So if I uh, use a red channel, go into mask and check the curvature, which is looking like this for now. Uh, let's just play around with the radius to make uh, the curvature work better. So now you can see we get these nice round edges of, of the curvature and you can play around with the bias. You can play around with all these parameters to get an interesting result, which you want to get. So multiply just multiplies the values, obviously. Um, let's just multiply and reduce the radius. So we get a thinner line. Uh, is that not working anymore? There we go. Occasionally hitting save is always a good thing to do. Okay, so this is now my mask slot. This goes into the range. I can now clamp those values a bit to get more refined lines. And smooth step is like a clamp value, so it doesn't go higher than one. Alrighty, let's just try this guy. Okay, so this is my mask. This goes into the um, curvature. And now you can see because we had duplicated it, we also um, decrease, uh, we have a dark multiplier. So if you want to make lighter edges, you need to hit add. So now I'm adding color to this. And you can see now this would be my base color. And if I if you check the final output now, you can see that he has now these nice brighter edges, which is very nice and exactly what we were going for. And the interesting thing for the curvature is you can have the convex, which is the um, the round shape, and you can have the concave, which is the inverse. And the concave in most cases is where you would collect dirt. So what I do like to do is I just duplicate the curvature node and switch the mode to concave and duplicate the color correct again, hook these guys up, connect here. And this time, this one goes, uh, we don't have a range now. We don't maybe need one and connect this here. So this is now the inverse. And instead of making it brighter, we want to make it darker in this section. So now you can see that we get these darker outlines right here and there, which is interesting. And the facing ratio is similar to the Maya one, which is um, sampler info. And from there, you can extract the facing ratio. This one is directly outputting the values you need, right? So uh, let's connect this to a range. The out value, this one outputs only float. So what you would need to do is, um, I'm not sure if there's a float to RGB actually. Float to RGB, there's actually one. So I think 
I'm not sure if I do this. Oh, it's kind of the same, I guess. If I would connect it there or there, it doesn't matter. So let's just connect this up. And, oops. Smaller node, move it over. Duplicate this. Obviously, you would sh you should be renaming this. So this would be, I guess, curvature convex, and this would be uh, facing. So I'm just stacking these guys t up together. This one goes here, and then the out red goes into the mask. All right, so. And let's see what this actually looks like. So this is the typical facing ratio node. So what I want to do now is I want to darken the edges, which are almost 90 degrees to the camera. So if I play around with the, with the gain and the bias, you can see um, what this does. So if I have a, let's see. Okay, so that's the bias. And if I play around with the gain, you can see what's happening here. And I just want to get really the outer edge. So what you can do is um, invert this guy, make it maybe linear so it's easier to control. Play around with the bias to just get the outer edge. Let's see if I can actually get it to work. There we go. So this is what I wanted to do. So now we only capture the 90 degrees surfaces faces of that geometry so um, I'm not sure of the linear whatever it really does I'm not entirely sure but you can see you get nicer control of your edges and you can have a softer fall off which is interesting so I think I'll be um, going with something like this and we can then control it a bit more clamping those values if you want to have more control and anyways this goes into the um, color correct node again and now because we have a multiply already this is the default one so now I'm multiplying with black and we get these nice darker edges which is very interesting and uh, let's see the final result for now and uh, you can see it's very interesting so if I wouldn't do that all these setups and I would connect it directly with my base color instead so this is how it would look like. You wouldn't get the nice curvature on the edges and all that stuff. So let's reconnect this guy to get this nice detail. And if you want to add these lines, which I had in, in the reference image, which I cannot move over anymore, which is on my second screen, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. Anyways, oh, maybe I can right click here. No. Okay, never mind. So the next thing is what I want to do. I want to add these lines. And because I don't have it UVs, uh, UV, I want to do these lines using a projection. So I'll just create a ramp shader based on a projection. And if you stop this for now and switch over to the view panes, um, you should get a place 3D node. And it's sm fairly small in the origin. So I'm just scaling it up for now. So the default projection is a planar one, which is exactly what we want. We want to project a oh, one. Um, you can see I'm actually translating the key light, which sucks. Um, so let's see if we come back, go back where we had it. I think we had it like this. Hopefully, okay. Um, back to perspective. So this is now my projection planar um, texture, 3D node. And this is projecting the ramp onto the object. So back to the hypershade, uh, we have the projection that goes in here, place 2D goes there. And this projection image is what we want to project on. So if I just choose out color for now and just plug it into my base and I initiate the render again, hitting play, you can see now what's happening. So the projected image is being applied and it's looking like this. So now I want to get this repetitive pattern. And to do that, I just need to make it white in the center, black on the outside, maybe scale these two guys a bit more down, um, add another white here. So we have a constant color in the center. And 
this is now the pattern and obviously you would need to make it a lot smaller so we go into place to d and maybe try 20 uh, repeats on this and you can see now you get these fine lines of something and you can play around with the noise and the 2d note so you can add some variation of noise patterns just to break up these lines so this is something which might work for you obviously it's too much but this will be a mask as well so um, we will just be moving these guys over first duplicate the facing ratio guy call this one maybe um, lines connect these two and the out red goes into mask and then color goes into base color so if you look through the lines node now you can see that we are multiplying so that's my default and if i just want to make it maybe brighter on these lines we can do that so now you get these nice streaky patterns here just because of we had this projection right so the final result looks like this now it's it's really subtle but you can definitely see the effect happening and so next step would be to maybe add some breakup and specs so you can just do an ai noise for this something really simple but you can make it more you can stack different noises together add really interesting results um, but this is now just showing you how you can do it pretty quick so um, looking through you can see it's a small pattern we want a large scale let's try 0.1 like this we add some detail we add some distortion, um, it's not updating. Let's just do update full scene, hit save. So now this is my distorted pattern and we want we don't want it to be really shiny. So we do like pretty rough as a base for 0.2 maybe. And the most rough thing would be maybe 0.6 like this. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so now you can see it's, uh, it's shiny, but it also has these rougher spots like this and you can also use this as an anisotropy map you just plug this the same thing into anisotropy and you get also nicer light response when it goes over the surface something you might consider so this is that let's just try to go in 100 percent so it's not scaled down uh, one to one a bit more detail in this guy we can still see we need to amp up the render settings but this is working so far pretty cool so what i said about anisotropy you can plug in a map here to get interesting results as well so it's kind of like a brushed metal which you can utilize so um, let's plug in a map in here let's just duplicate the noise and plug it into anisotropy so middle mouse drag then you get this dialogue so out color Red goes into spec anisotropy. And the default value is what we just said is uh, 0.6 and uh, 0.2 and 0.6. So we can go pretty high to almost one and maybe a bit lower. So let's see what we get. So this is now driven by a noise pattern. And if we play around with the rotation, you can see very interesting things. So if it would move into light and out of light, you can see that this effect would be appearing on the surface and you can also control rotation with a map as well so that's up to you um, so what else um, we can try to add some bump with the with these lines so let's do that so let's create a bump to denote uh, the projection image is uh, the value so we connect the red to the bump value and the out normal goes into the normal camera so now we've got the bump on it obviously too strong so play around with the value 0.1 maybe you can still see it's i would say and for my taste it's too strong so let's have it one more time even that is still too strong so i have again it's getting there so let's show it 0.1 i think this looks reasonable you can see the nice effect on it let's see what we get here and i think it works pretty good um, so now you, this is kind of all I wanted to show, which is the stacking of color correct notes and driving them with mass. So this is a very convenient and easy way to set it up. And you can now play around to add dust layers or all that fancy stuff. Um, but this is now a pretty 
good result to illustrate how to set it up. It looks like a bronze um, bust or something. Um, so this is my original, just default shader. This is with the metal and all these procedurals. So I'm saving this one as well. And I just want to just now for a quick thing, play around with um, thin film. It's also very interesting and it gets, gives you like this oily coat. So let's just uh, render this part here and enable it, the thickness. So you can see what's going on there. And you can drive the thickness with a map. And let's try to do that. So I'll just create a noise again. And you, before we plug it in, you can see I have a value of 300 now. We get this nice purplish stuff, right? So keep that value in mind. So we connect the noise to the thickness. Out color red goes into uh, thin film thickness. And uh, let's check isolate selected. So we get an interesting pattern. So this is again too small. So let's try maybe 0.1. And uh, let's add some octaves for detail and really distort it quite a bit to get these weird circular patterns. Yeah, that's cool. And then we had a value of 300, right? So uh, let's try maybe value 300 and value 800. And uh, let's see the result. You can see now there's definitely some color on this guy. And you can see it looks like an oily something. It's, it might be definitely too strong. So we just uh, reduce these numbers a bit. 70, maybe let's reduce it more. And you can see you get different patterns. So. It's something you can play around with. And even if you want to change the, the, the pattern itself, you can just uh, scale it up, change the distortion amount, get something interesting here. Let's try 800 again. I like that pretty much. So it's more like an oily or like a hot, whatever it is. It's interesting, I guess. Um, and then we can add a code if we want to do that on top of this. So my base is uh, a pretty rough image i guess and if you feel free uh just add a coat on top um you can play around with the ior make it more shiny more um, like a thicker coat layer on top of this guy um right so that's on it's hard to see because we have the, the base on as well but if you would um, create AUVs, you can just isolate the code. Let's just do that and you can see what's going on. So render settings, AUVs, and uh, let's just do coat. Uh, let's just do spec. Just for the fun of it, let's check the code. So this would be my code layer, which is very shiny and good looking and then my def default spec is just this guy and they get blended together in the beauty so you get these nice hot pings on this guy um, it's a different result than we had in the introduction but it's also very interesting and you can see how easy you can just create this interesting metal looking effect just with these simple procedural noises and obviously if you want to make a more interesting render uh, what I like to do is set up um, depth of field and to do that I have a little helper script which does the hard work for you. Uh, to do so you select your camera, you select your object, you go to light shader, helper, focus rig and yeah it creates you this um, focal point. And with that, you can actually easy control your distance and your yeah your depth of field. So I will show you how it works. Um, because depending on scene scale, your aperture might be too low. So you might need to increase this guy. You can see now the focal point is somewhere on his arm. Uh, but I want to move it a bit up on his, uh, let's say on his nose. Let's enable wireframe. Mm, 
like this. And okay, so now I think it should be updating properly. So now the focal point is kind of in his face area. You can see the fall off is very strong. So uh, we need to in uh, decrease the aperture. Let's try this. So this is out of focus. Check the beauty. Change the mode to be shaded. And now his arm should be a bit out of focus. I think it's already too much. So let's try maybe two. Yeah, this might just work. Yeah, so this sums up the tutorial and I hope you, you liked it and you got a few new tricks in your toolbox to do new interesting shaders. Let's just render this for good. And again, um, all the stuff you can get access to on my Patreon page, you get... Um, yeah, you get the access to source files, you get the Maya file, you get the environment light, you get the mesh, final renders, all that stuff. So um, yeah, give me a thumbs up if you like this video. And obviously, I like your support. I really appreciate your input on all the stuff I'm doing. And yeah, I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.